little bit of sugar and a little bit of water in there as well, and you get the yeast to ferment, and as it produces carbon dioxide, it slowly inflates these balloons. And then you can do an experiment with it. The experiment would be, well, let's see what happens when I change the yeast, uh, change the number of yeast cells I start off with, or if I change the concentration of sugar I bring into my conical flask, or maybe you change the temperature of your conical flask is at, you see which balloon inflates the biggest. Yeah? But it's not really very scientific. At the end of the experiment, the kids are going to look at this and go, well, one balloon's big and the other one's really little, and it's all very abstract. They haven't got any data that goes with that. So if I was going to do this experiment now, this is much more the kind of thing I would do. I'd get myself a Raspberry Pi or another computer. It doesn't have to be a Raspberry Pi, other computers are available. But you want a computer and a camera. I point my camera at the blue and I take photographs every X seconds. So if it's a really slow experiment, I might take photographs every couple of minutes, right? But I might want to take photographs every microsecond perhaps. So I take those photos and if I was teaching Key Stage 2 kids, I'd maybe make an animated GIF of the whole thing to make them see how the balloons change in size. I might get them just look at the pictures up on their screen and I might get them ruler out, measure the size of all the balloons. Okay? If I was doing it with a Key Stage 3, four or five class and I get into some proper computer science with them. Okay, so I would take all those photographs and I'd use some image recognition technology. So my preferred one is OpenCV. But there's loads and loads of different ways you can do this with, with a little bit of programming. Lots of online tutorials to help you. And you can do it with a little bit of code. You can get it to measure the size of those balloons. Okay? And then all of a sudden, you've got data that you didn't have before, that it would almost be impossible to get before. But using computers, using the power of programming, you can get some real data out of an experiment like this. Other experiments I've done with uh, the Raspberry Pi in particular and uh, add on board called Sense Hat, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so, this one, this is another classic science experiment that gets done in schools up and down the country. It's called a fire sulfate reaction, and it's when you mix some chemicals together, it slowly starts to go cloudy. And when it gets so cloudy that you can't see through the solution anymore, that's your end point for the reaction. Okay? So that, that's where your that's where your stops. And again, you change the temperature or you change the concentration of your solutions that you're using, and you see how that affects the time. But we stick a sensor underneath it, some lights, a little camera on the top looking down, a little bit of code, and again, it knows when it can't see through the solution anymore. You can run that experiment, you can go off, have a cup of tea and leave it, you can go be engaged with the students and other things, talking about the theory, you can come back and you've got that data. Okay? Really, really, really simple one. Again, use a temperature sensor, shove it in some aluminium foil with your computer, shine a big bright light on it, okay? And watch how the temperature changes when you cover it covered in aluminium foil, or when you cover it in black cloth, or when you cover it in styrofoam, or whatever it is, and you can see how the temperature changes. And your computer is logging all that data. There's no running over with a little mercury alcohol thermometer and looking at it and then running back over to your textbook and writing down what the uh, what the temperature is at you know one minute, two minutes, and three minutes. All this data is captured for you. This one is a respiration experiment. So you put a computer into a plastic bag with a humidity sensor in it, and you look at what the humidity is. And then you get the kids to get a straw and they blow into the bag, and you check how the humidity changes to show that there's water vapor in your breath. Okay? And maybe what you can do then is you can get the kids to just like sit down, chill out for a couple of minutes, and then breathe in. And then you can have the kids run on the spot for 20 minutes, okay? or depending on how cruel a teacher you are, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever you want. So you get the kids to do a little bit of exercise, and then they blow in the bag because their respiration rates increased, they've got more water vapor into their lungs, so you're teaching them about respiration, but you don't, but this is something that would be really difficult to do without something like a Raspberry Pi, without a sensor, without a humidity sensor, but you can get data that you can then graph. Now, this is me, I don't know whether this, video, this link video is going to work, but this was an experiment I was doing. I took a Raspberry Pi and put a battery on it, I shoved it in a plastic bag. Is this going to be a video? Doesn't matter. <laughs> I put a Raspberry Pi in a plastic bag with a battery, took it out on the green in front of my house, okay? uh, and I started spinning it around my head like this. Okay, so I had it down here and I started spinning it round and round and round and round. Why am I doing that? Well, from that, I can get data.
data. Okay, so this is the data that my Raspberry Pi captured while I was doing it. All right. So what can I show the kids? So I can have kids in the classroom do this. Raspberry Pi is cheap. Okay, if, if the kid lets go and it flies across the classroom, apart from the health and safety concerns, you've only lost 26 pounds. All right, in terms of the computer. So the data that I've got from this, I can now use. I can show kids. Well, look, these two lines down here. Okay, that's the acceleration that the computer was feeling when I was just carrying it, and it's, it's, it's pretty close to zero, okay? But here, this other line, this is the acceleration that that Raspberry Pi was experiencing when I was just holding it down here on the ground. So what was that caused by? Well, that was caused by gravity, okay? So I had um, one G of gravity, 10 meters per second per second, acting on that Raspberry Pi when it was in the back. What happened when I started spinning around my head? Well, look, these ones barely changed very much, but this, this one here, this shot up, and so all of a sudden it was experiencing a huge amount of acceleration as I was spinning it around. Okay, so I could talk then about centripetal acceleration to the students, maybe I want to mix it in, and the way I did this was it was talking about it in a science lesson, so how spinning around and around and around can simulate gravity. Okay, and so how that could be applied to maybe, you know, in the future, in space travel, you have space stations like in 2001 that spin round and round and round and round, and they simulate gravity. So we're getting a little bit of data out here that I'm able to just graph automatically. How do I do that? I use Matplotlib personally. Okay. It's scary for a lot of people to use Matplotlib. All right, but this is a, a little add-on that you can get into Python, the programming language Python, but it's used by data scientists all around the world. All right? In universities now, a lot of scientists are using Python to do all their analysis, to do all their data analysis, because it's a simple language okay, that's very easy for them to learn. So, for me, you could get the data, get it as a CSV sheet, get all just the text, copy it into Excel, select the columns, go to the graph, pick the right graph. Okay, you've got about 15, 20 minutes work there. If you're doing it with students, you've probably got about three or four hours work there. Okay, but with that plot there, I do it with that many lines of code. Okay, so I've got one little line up here to get that plot there in. This is my data. All right, so I can pull that data straight in from my sensors if I wanted. All right, I can have live graphing. I can have graphs being drawn on the screen as the experiment's happening. All right, so the data comes in, and these two little lines here, they're the ones that actually draw my graph. I'll get out of the way for people who want to photograph the code. It's online. You search map or maybe in Google and you'll get it. All right. So this is, this is stuff that you can do with kids in science lessons. You're bringing computer science into your lesson as well. You could do it in a way where you're going, I'm not going to actually explain the computer science to you. Just use this code and run it and it will work. Or you could, if you wanted to, start explaining a little bit about computer science as well at the same time and explain to them that this is a list or an array and, and this kind of stuff. We do, at the foundation, a huge amount with science, okay? If anything, we should probably start branching out, looking at some other subjects as well. So, um, at the foundation, we have lots of science-based projects that we use the Raspberry Pi for that get data, okay? I'm a data, I'm a bit of a data nerd. I like data, I like numbers, I like graphs, okay? I'm a bit weird like that. So, this is the weather station. We've just given out a thousand of these to schools. So, all over the world, we're gonna have a thousand weather stations, and they are going to be getting rain data, wind data, and temperature data, and they're going to be uploading all of that to a big Oracle database for us. And you guys, if you're teachers, if you're science teachers, or if you just like numbers, okay, you'll be able to use that data. That's going to be freely available for you to use in your lessons. You'll be able to look at what the weather's like in Jamaica, what the weather's like in schools in Africa, because all this data is going to be open. So this is one of our projects. This is another project that we do. This is called the Astro Pi Project. The person to speak to about Astro Pi is the guy manically waving over there, that's Space Dave, and address him as that thing, Space Dave. Okay? So Dave has done, has worked a huge amount on the Astro Pi project. At the moment, we have got two Astro Pies up in space on the International Space Station, which is just incredible. Two Raspberry Pies on the International Space Station. And they are, they're doing some stuff with code, the, the competition that Dave will tell you about. But what interests me about it is they are logging data. They're getting the temperature, the humidity, acceleration. They're logging that data all the time. They're keeping that data. And when eventually we get those SD cards back off um, ESA, the uh, European Space Agency will have that data that we'll publicise and again you'll be able to use. Uh, this is our... Uh, 
got an instant hot air balloon, high altitude ballooning, the stuff that we do. So James is around somewhere up there, if you want to go talk to James, he knows all about the high altitude ballooning, that's his little pet project, but again, take a Raspberry Pi, put it onto a big helium balloon, send it up into the upper atmosphere, that's 35 kilometers above the Earth, taking photographs, and yes, again, it's gathering data, it's recording its temperatures, recording its altitude, it's recording its humidity, it's getting all this data, and when it comes back down, huge amount of science you can do with the kids. Just a colossal amount of science you can do with students based on that one project. You can put one of these balloons up in the upper atmosphere for about 100 pounds. Um, last one I'm going to talk about really quickly. This is the garden robot. A lovely, lovely little project. Um, so with a garden robot, you've got this uh, little temperature sensor that you can put into the soil. Okay, and again, it will log data. You can even get this with this garden robot. You can start altering the behavior. You can start like, increase the temperature when it gets a little bit warm or decrease the temperature. Um, and you can start playing around with plants and logging the data and affecting the plants environment. And at 11.09, I've got to stop talking now. Um, so, yeah, just to finish off, I think computing is a really powerful tool. All right, I love computing, but I love science, and I think we should be using computing in as many curriculum areas as possible. Okay, if you want to come and talk to me about it, I'll be around here all day. Okay, so just come over and talk to me, um, or talk to any of the guys in the white coats over there, and talk to them about how we use it. So, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.